special because um, it's our night that we uh, have a dedication, uh, a celebration, if you will, of um, a man's life. Uh, John Stomberg was uh, a man who was on uh, the huge board up to last year, and, um, and he passed away last year in the fall, and he demonstrated some amazing characteristics, some amazing characteristics, and from his life, we wanted to honor him by giving this plaque to somebody who's not on the huge board, but who has attended the forums or the vans, part of this ministry, who demonstrates those same characteristics, those same characteristics. And I would like to invite his family to come up. This is his wife, Karen, and his two sons. Come on up. <clears throat> so they're going to share a little bit with you guys. Thank you so much. Um, these are two of our sons. This is our youngest, Jesse and our oldest Joshua and on behalf of myself and my family I want to thank the board of huge men of God for honoring and remembering the life of my late husband John Stomberg. It is a privilege to be here tonight to participate in the recognition of this year's scholarship recipient. John believed in the vision, purpose, and values of this organization honoring God, unifying man, growing in Christ, and equipping disciples. He had a heart to serve men and understood the message of grace and the power to change. John was a changed man. He took what God did in him and poured into others, men like yourselves, by encouraging you, standing with you, believing in you, and never giving up on you. Thank you for continuing his legacy. All right, so the characteristics that we saw in John was unconditional love, faithful servant, peace, forgiveness, generosity. And as Karen said, he was one of the biggest servers I have ever known. This year's recipient, and by the way, you um, will get a free hotel, the high-end hotel at the men's events. Everything's covered. It's, it, that hotel room is yours. Willie Rosebird. Where, where is he? There you are. Come on up. So we'll, uh, we'll display this at the, um, the room that you get. So you have uh, the hotel room. You can share it with somebody. You could charge them extra, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, you could come in here and give me 100 bucks. But um, So that's all taken care of, et cetera. So we wanted to just um, encourage you. You have been an amazing example. And as it says, carrying on John's legacy. And we see that in you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I knew it. So tonight's speaker, uh, what I really enjoy about um, our speaker tonight is uh, I'll read a certain passage or a certain book, and I think I feel, okay, I'm starting to hear what you're saying, God. I started hearing what you're saying. I, I, okay, I'm starting to get a grasp on it. And then, G, then DJ preaches on it, and I go, oh, there's another side of this coin. Oh, there's a whole other way to look at it. And, and I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that. I mean, because God is so personal. He's so individual. 
His word speaks specifically to each one of us. And I love that Pastor G DJ can bring that perspective. And he's very, very energetic. So as a teacher, you know, students love that kind of a person. So I'm going to take this plaque before he knocks it over and knocks everything out of the way. But uh, he, he is, comes with a, a perspective, um, a, a new way of looking at, at, at the word, and he has a great way to deliver it. And people just really respond to it. So will you guys welcome Pastor DJ Ray. some stuff tonight to help you understand the word a little bit here. Always got to have a mirror. I am, I, am, I am not doing that. And uh, We'll leave this thing for, we'll leave that thing for later. And then maybe in a minute somebody can uh, give me those books. But um, man, it's great to see so many new faces. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's DJ. I pastor a church called The House in Snohomish, Washington. And when I say pastor, here's what I mean. Uh, what I mean is I extend people the opportunity to continue the ministry and the message of Jesus. And then I help them along that way to eliminate their excuses. That is my job description. It's not really a job, but... One day I just figured I should probably just think of one of those. And so that's it. <laughs> you know, they, they, they say, well, what do you do? You know, that's what I do. That is what I do. I literally give people an opportunity to continue the, the message and the ministry of Jesus. And I find myself, most of the time, trying to help people eliminate their excuses. So, um, I'm going to help eliminate some of yours Tonight, I've been married for 23 years to the very same woman. Yeah, yeah, to the same person. Um, and I'm the father of three children, ages 20, 15, and 13. I know, I know. I don't look that old, I know. Uh, but, but God has radically, radically saved me. And many do not know this, but when I was in the seventh grade, I actually died from alcohol overdose and, and, and came back to life. Had an out-of-body experience, the whole thing, came back to life. And um, God has radically saved me from, from a life of alcohol, drug addiction, dealing drugs, and, and from living basically an overall sinful and destructive life. And man, he's given me a new life, and I'm so excited about what he's doing in me, through me, for the sake of others. And I'm so grateful, I'm so thankful. Regardless of whether um, you're at the beginning of this journey, in the middle of this journey, or nearing the end of your journey and your new journey in heaven, I, I really do believe that these, these forums are going to be a blessing to you. They're going to help you change. And um, if, you, if, you, if you're ready to stop following Jesus from a distance and move forward one step, wherever you are, one step closer to Jesus, man, I want to I wanna be a part of that. I want to help you move from where you are to where you want to be and where God wants you to be most importantly. So... Choosing to follow Jesus was undeniably the best decision I ever made. 
Who would agree with me and say that choosing to follow Jesus was the greatest decision, undeniably the greatest decision that they ever made? Awesome. Now, those of you that responded, um, how many of you have ever denied or disputed Jesus since you undeniably made him the most important part of your life? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy that we can say, hey, you know, choosing to follow Jesus undisputedly undeniably was the best decision I ever made. But yet then we can turn around and deny him. Dispute him. Dispute his will that he wants to do in our life. It's crazy, man. Um, say with me undeniable. Undeniable. Un Deniable. Undeniable means this. It means incapable of being denied or disputed. And tonight I want to talk about this because what if your faith was incapable of being denied or disputed? See, because the reality is everyone in this auditorium and let me translate everyone. Everyone. Everyone in this auditorium will be tempted to deny their faith. And everyone in this auditorium will be tempted by others. They will challenge, they will dispute whether your faith is real, whether your faith is genuine, whether your faith is authentic. I mean, this is the, the theme, is it not? I mean, what makes one's faith undeniable? What makes one's faith authentic? I mean, this whole year's theme is the authentic man. But I thought to myself, what in the world does an authentic man look like? So, I brought a mirror. Joe, can you pass it around? I mean, just don't, don't let it go, but just, 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 just go show this to some people, okay? Can you do that for me? And just, just, just see if you can find any authentic man. I mean, we're going to get real tonight. I guarantee you that. I mean, what is a real man? What is a real authentic man? It reminds me of those, dare I say, dumb bumper stickers. And if you have one, I I'm not going to apologize for saying this. I'm going to unapologetically say this. <laughs> these, these, these bumper stickers that say, real men follow Jesus. Real men love Jesus. Man, as an unbeliever, I, I, I saw those bumper stickers, and I'm like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then I got born again, and I see those bumper stickers, and I think to myself, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I mean, is that what a real man is? One that looks like a man, or one that loves Jesus? Because I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of men that say that they love Jesus and they ain't real. They're not real with God, they're not real with themselves, and they're not real with you. So we might as well crack this open tonight and find out what it really means to be real. Because here's what I'm thinking. Um, we're not really trying to discover what it means to... Um, be an authentic man, per se, I think really what we're trying to get down to the bottom of is, I think the real question is this, what does a man who has authentic faith in Jesus look like? That's what I want to know. Isn't that what you want to know? 
Because I think every one of us is a real man. I mean, I don't know these days. But I ain't going to be checking. <laughs> so let's just assume everyone in here is a real man. But what does an authentic man look like? How about that? Does this make me an authentic man? Yeah, just a guy with a hat that says authentic on it. It's kind of like that guy that you did business with that had a, a fish on their business card. Remember that dude? <laughs> man, this doesn't make me an authentic man. Authentic, to authenticate, to prove to be true or genuine. That's what it means. If tonight you were asked to authenticate your faith, how would you do that? I mean, how would you prove your faith in Jesus to be authentic? Authenticating our faith is going to involve some things. It's going to involve not only what we believe, but whom we believe and in whom we trust. Not only who we are, but whose we are. Identifying what an, what, what an authentic faith in Jesus is is really part of the overall theme of the book of James. And, and James is deep, man. How many know James is pretty deep? And a lot of us don't want to go that deep. And so, you know, we're just going to take some key passages out of there and fill it in and see if we can find out what authentic faith looks like. James 2 Verse 17 through 20, even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, here's what's important to note about the book of James. James is not addressing the faith that leads to salvation. Okay? He's addressing what the faith of those who are saved should look like. So think of it this way, James isn't addressing our faith to be saved, but our faith to serve the one who saved us. And it's also important to note that the works part of what James is speaking about, are not works that lead to salvation. But the works that should precede the one who is saved. And, and you got to know that when you read James or you'll get jacked up. You'll get it all twisted, man. So what then does a man who has authentic faith in Jesus look like? Because some men tonight, if you, were be, if you were to be asked to authenticate your faith, you would get ticked off. You'd be like, how dare you, dude? Who are you to ask me that kind of question? Who do you think you are? Prove my faith. Authenticate my faith. 
Some of you, maybe others, you'd sidestep the question, you dodge the question, while others, you might be quick to blurt out all the good deeds you've done in order to build your case. But let's see if we can paint a picture of what an authentic faith in Jesus looks like. I mean, think about it, guys. If you were really asked to authenticate your faith tonight, and let's just say you've been asked already <laughs> several times, um, so you've had some time to think about it already, what would you say? See, I don't think we witness to people expecting for them to ask us tough questions. I think we just want to talk to people. Tell them everything we know. And consider that and chalk it up as sowing seed. Or watering seed. If you were asked to authenticate your faith, what would you say? What would you do? Could I rephrase the question this way? Uh, if you were accused of being a faithful follower of Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict you or would you be acquitted of all charges? Now do you understand the question? I mean, what is faith anyways? Hebrews 11.1, 1, watch this, says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, let me just put in parentheses here, because I don't think Hebrews 11.1 1 is talking about um, fake faith. I think it's talking about real faith. I think it's talking about authentic faith. So let me reread it. Now, authentic faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, according to the scriptures, faith is the evidence. Not the lack of evidence. Do you see that? So then authentic faith uh, must be based upon evidence or what we know. Not the lack of evidence or what we don't know. Now, if you have your Bibles... Go down to uh, verse 3. It says, by faith, that is authentic faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, we understand. What? By faith, we understand. Yeah, by faith we understand. Not, we don't understand, so we're just going to walk by faith. How many of you have ever heard somebody say that? How many of you have said it? Well, I don't quite understand, so I'm just going to walk by faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand. So, so I don't get it. It seems like, according to the scriptures, authentic faith is based on what we understand, not upon what we don't understand. I mean, think about it. How in the world is a faith that is based on what you can't see and what you don't understand ever going to be a faith that is undeniable? I don't even think that makes sense on earth, let alone in heaven. See, one of our biggest misconceptions I think people have regarding faith is they think that they are exercising their faith when they act on something they can't see or don't understand. And I don't understand that. And I can't see how that is. When you look at the scriptures... I mean, when you listen to a whole bunch of other people, that's different. When you look at the scriptures, I don't see how you could actually come to that conclusion. I mean, it sounds super spiritual, but as we see here, it's not very scriptural. I think this is where the term blind faith comes from. You know, uh, biblical, authentic faith isn't blind. It's bold. It's bold. Now, uh, could you 
blindfold, blindfold this guy, Atlanta Brave fan. Right? Atlanta Braves? All blacked out? Okay, now, what's your name? What's your name? Brian. Brian. Okay, so Brian, I don't want to give him a... <laughs> wow, you all right? I didn't tell him to hurt you. Okay, Brian, and then how about... What's your name? Jeff. Jess? Okay, so I got five bucks somewhere. Don't I got five bucks? Oh, man. Better get five bucks. Okay. I got five dollars. And, um, and Jess. And what was your name? Brian. Okay. Uh, when I count to three, I want you to come get this five dollars. Okay. One, two, three. Come get it. You feel bad? Why do you feel bad? All right. <laughs> hey, that's good. That's good. No, you keep it. You can't keep the blindfold, though. Can't keep that, brother. Got to reuse that. Oh, man, you're going to have to figure that out. Get that back to me. All right. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm one of those guys that likes to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And it's really hard to, to, to search for evidence blindly. See, Jess felt bad. Because he knew he, was gonna, he, he, knew he had the advantage. Well, good. So do you, guys. You got the advantage. Because you can see. You get more when you can see. Faith is the evidence, not the lack of evidence. Not the overcompensation of the lack of evidence. Well, I don't know. I don't know a lot, so I must be in really a lot of faith right now. Because I don't know crap. Honestly, guys, it doesn't make any sense. So you may have come here tonight looking for evidence that Jesus is real. I'm so glad you did because you're going to get a lot of it. Uh, you're going to leave tonight with undeniable evidence. And, and, and because I'm telling you what, there are people that will tell you that instead of searching for evidence, you just need to have faith. These people are either part of the cover-up or they have not heard that faith is evidence. And maybe you should tell them. You want evidence? If it's evidence you want, there's plenty of evidence. I mean, and I'm talking about beyond, beyond the word. I mean, there are writings and writings and writings that prove, that bear witness of who Jesus is. There, are, there is archaeology upon archaeology upon archaeology. There are prophecies upon prophecies. There are, have been miracles upon miracles. Is there any miracle sitting in the room tonight? There's miracles. And, and, and then not, not only that, there's, there's witnesses upon witnesses. Are there any witnesses in the room tonight? You want evidence? You're going to get a lot of evidence. Just open your eyes. You're not going to get a lot of evidence closing your eyes. Not looking. Man, I stand before you tonight as one of those witnesses. And even though I have never seen Jesus in the flesh, I guarantee you this. It doesn't mean that I haven't seen Jesus. And even though I never lived with Jesus, I, I guarantee you this, I still know Jesus lives and that he lives in me. And, and, and you know what? You're going to see the proof of that. 
I mean, somebody who has been with Jesus, um, you're going to know it. A person whose faith is based on concrete evidence is a person whose faith is clearly evident. Remember what we read in Hebrews 11, faith is the substance, the confidence. Authentic faith is confident. Faith is the evidence, the proof. Authentic faith does not ignore the evidence. Ignoring the evidence is covering up the evidence. The more evidence one has, the more confident they are. The less confidence one is, the more they cover up. You see this? So, authentic faith in Jesus, what does it look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It's based on evidence and the confidence that comes from that. Discovery of what is real. This is what James is saying. I mean, he's saying authentic faith, uh, confidence in Jesus is much more than a confession. Authentic faith is not demonstrated by one's lip service, but by one's life's service. Look at James 2 verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so authentic faith without works or evidence is dead Inactive, out of service also. I'll read it without the parentheses that I put in it. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. But here's what it means. I mean, it's talking about, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so authentic faith, because he's not talking about fake faith, without works, evidence, right, is dead, inactive, out of service. It's just dead. It's not not there. It's just not doing anything. Remember, James isn't talking about the faith that saves us. He's talking about the faith of service of the one who is saved. Of the one that saved us. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. What does Romans 10, 17 tell us? Your turn. I just read it. That faith comes, how faith comes. And it comes how? By hearing, by hearing what? Okay. So let's assume for a moment that every one of us has some faith. Some of you, that's what you got. Others, that's what you got. Some of you, like that, and some of you, you're all that. Okay, let's give you some more, because you have really heard a lot. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Okay, so that means according to what you've heard, may have something to do with the amount of faith you got. Now I guess, let, let me just make one thing clear. Um, 
There's not levels of grace, but there are levels of faith. Because, see, if there was levels of grace, there'd be levels of sin. And if you read your Bible and you think that there's uh, levels of sin, you're going to get the gospel all weirded out. Sin, sin. Now, so let's assume for a moment, all of us have faith in Jesus. Some a little. You've heard a little. You got, you know, you got, maybe this is your first time you heard anything. That's all you got. You got one book. You got a few books, a few more, a lot of books, right? A few of you got huge faith. <laughs> Just threw, that was a softball, right? <laughs> Dang. I don't know. You guys weren't ready for that. Strike one. <laughs> All right, James 2, verse 19 and 20. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble and tear. tear. Verse 20, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? See, here's what I want you to notice. Notice James doesn't give an amount of faith. He just says faith. D do you notice that? You say you have faith. And it doesn't matter how much you've heard, how much you know, how much faith you have. If you don't act on it, it's what? Useless. Let's see what Jesus said about this quickly. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. Jesus is actually looking for those who are putting feet to their faith. I mean, many of us believe. Who believes? It's good to be healthy. None of you? Y'all had pizza tonight. Many believe regular exercise is, is, is a healthy practice. But how many of us actually exercise regularly? See, there's that guy. There's always that guy. I do, pastor. I know you do. I know you do. And that's a good thing. Jesus said, more blessed are all those who hear the word of God and put it into practice. See, just reading and hearing that what Jesus said, you know, go make disciples. And knowing the book, the, the book, is there any Bibles in this church? They must all bring their Bibles to church. That's cool. Um, I mean, just knowing what the book says, knowing the chapter, knowing, you know, where everything is, chapter and verse. That, awesome, but that doesn't make disciples. Till somebody goes and does. Well, I don't know, I might fail. That's why they call it practice. Put it into practice. Look, I'm not here to give you more information, man. I'm not. I'm not that guy. I'm, I'm here to, to inspire you to put God's word into practice. So let me try to close this up. What we do doesn't always define who we are. But who you are will determine what you do. You say you have faith. Do something. I mean, our faith should inspire us, just not inform us. I mean, it should inspire us, right? To, to think to do, and to be differently. And that's really the end. To be different. I mean, I think, I think Dan it, it, it just 
magnificently laid that out for us last week. Because you can hear something and you can do something and it will never transform you into a new person. But if you are transformed into a new person, I guarantee you, you'll do different, you'll think different, you'll say different. You know why? Because you is different. I know are different. I, I just, I did that on purpose. If you were a different person, then you currently would be living out these undeniable facts. You would think differently. You would act differently because you would be different. Man, I got books. As, as probably a lot of you do. I got so many books. I got books coming out of my books, man. I got books that give biblical instruction in every single arena of life. And some of them, man, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just throwing them away. Marriage counseling books. Why do I need those? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it that way. I got, I got, you know what? God's told me how to counsel people, give counsel to them, not counsel them. <laughs> I mean, I, we, got, we got books on every subject. And, and we got more versions of the Bible than we need, right? Oh my gosh, you're reading out of that version? Oh. I've read that before. We got more versions. I mean, when I read about the life of Jesus or hear God's word taught or preached with inspiration and practical application, I'm motivated to do it. That's why I bring all this stuff. This isn't a game. This isn't a show. This is to motivate you to actually do it. So every time you see a book, you're like, oh, I remember that crazy guy that laughed, you know. Well, every time you go and paint your house, oh, I haven't talked about that one yet. <laughs> every time you play pin the tail on the donkey, you're going to remember this message. <laughs> oh my gosh. How would you ever forget it? The more we just not hear, but apply, do, act on the teachings of God's word, the more we authenticate our faith. That's how we do it. You want to know how to authenticate your faith? That's how you do it. You apply it. As you apply it, it'll grow. You want more faith? Do what you know. Quit complaining about what you don't have. Just use what you do have. It isn't how much we know that makes our faith grow. It's, it's what we do with what we know. Faith is like the stuff in this can. Faith is like paint. The, the value of faith is in its application. The value of this paint is in its application. If it's never applied, it's kind of like what James said. Just sitting here dormant, doing nothing. Not being of any use or... And I'm not the smartest guy, but <laughs> I mean, right? What value is a can of pain if it's never applied? The same can be said of our faith. So what are you doing with what you've heard? What are you doing with what you know? What, what are you doing with what you believe? What are you doing this th with, with this thing called faith? Is your faith authenticated? It's the last thing I'm going to show you. I wish I had. I wish I had. So maybe I should start doing the PowerPoint thing. I don't know, man. Every time you guys ask me, hey, DJ, you got your PowerPoint? I'm like, No. I don't do PowerPoint. I do power pages. 
You know, I just want people in the pages. Power pages point thing. But this would look good on a PowerPoint slide. So anyways, here we go. You want to authenticate your... Authenticating your faith is affirming your faith. That's what it is. Affirming your faith is applying your faith. And applying faith is... Applied faith is... Authentic faith. If you're here, this, you know, this evening and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, man, I get it. I remember when I was there. And you know what I wanted? More evidence. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Boy, did I get it. If that's you tonight, man, don't make your decision based on what I said. Make a decision based upon the evidence. If you need to see more, open your eyes. Ask the person who brought you. Challenge them. I think they're more ready than they were than when they came in here tonight to answer some questions. See, because it's the evidence that Jesus lived. It's the evidence that Jesus died. It's the evidence that Jesus rose again that forms, that strengthens, and serves as a sure, unshakable, undeniable, and authentic faith in Jesus. Can I pray for you? Father, this is serious business. You don't call this the kingdom of God for nothing. I know we're in a church, but you said church twice. And you said kingdom over a hundred times. Gentlemen, I, I welcome you to the kingdom of God. It's what it looks like. It's what it feels like. It's what it does. Father, I pray that you would give us a bold faith. Let us dismiss the notion of blind faith. Of faith that comes without evidence. How could that be? Faith is evidence. Faith that comes without knowing. By faith we understand. Father, I pray that we would go out of here. Into our groups and into our communities. And we would begin to apply the faith that we see. The faith that we understand. The authentic faith of a man that follows you. Father, I thank you for the good report in advance. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen.